Hi, my name is Amy Dalton Hardy and I am a freelance consultant and producer. I specialise in the arts, in performing arts and outdoor arts and I work across the Midlands. And I also work on a lot of fundraising with artists and organisations. Today I'm going to be talking to you about fundraising in the arts, so the Elusive Arts Council project grants and other types of grant fundraising and revenue streams um, and a bit about being a freelancer since I am a freelancer um, and how to make all that work. So to begin with, a bit about what being freelance in the arts and cultural sector particularly, but minded that some of you watching this might be from the creative industries, the wider creative industries, as well as an artist and or an artist or work in the cultural sector. So what does it involve? It can be a mixture of things and it's broadly known as working on a portfolio. So an example is I work on a portfolio of different projects and services that I offer out to the sector, to individuals and to organisations, but that might mean different things to different people who are freelancers in the sector. It might mean that you work on contracts, you have a service, you produce a product that you sell. Um, it, could, it could mean a whole range of different things. Um, and in the context of fundraising, it's quite important that you know what that is and you know you have a clear understanding of what your offer is um, before you go into to any grant fundraising um, so that you're super clear on that and you can tell your story from the get-go. There are some other types of work that you might come across as a freelancer. Um, commonly in the cultural sector particularly, there are commissions, up for grabs, a range of funders or organisations will often um, put out commissions to the sector, so it's worth looking out for those within the sector. And I'll talk about where they uh, get advertised and how to respond to them a bit later. But it's also, um, you could also have bread and butter work. Um, and that's a bit of a colloquial term, but bread and butter work could mean how I define it and my bread and butter work is stuff that kind of happens in the background which enables you to do your art over there, if you like, pays the bills. Um, so I'll go into a bit of that because that is a crossover into different types of revenue that keep your business going, that keep you going as a freelance, self-employed person in the sector. So being freelance, you are a business. You might be a sole trader, you might be a social ent enterprise, or you might be a, a type of company, and there's lots of different types of company. And that's important in the context of fundraising and um, looking for grants, bursaries, commissions, because not all funders will fund an individual, um, with the exception of the Arts Council, who do not specify your constitution. And the constitution is how you are set up, whether you are a CIC, a limited company, or a charitable organisation. Um, and that there's a bit to unpick there and there's lots of advice out there if you look around your local um, community and voluntary service has a lot of information on that if you are to want to explore that in more detail um, but essentially you are either providing a service or a product or maybe a mixture of both um, you're a big part of the sector as a freelancer it's it's a very very high percentage that people work as freelancers we kind of prop up the sector if you like and the most important thing to remember is we are all needed um, and the money is out there and it is there up for the grabs. You just need to know how. Uh, so as a freelancer, you're probably working on a broad portfolio of different types of work within your specialism or a particular area within the sector. And as I mentioned earlier, I work in dance and the performing arts. I work with theatre companies, performance companies, and I also work in festivals and outdoor arts. Sometimes they cross over, sometimes they don't, sometimes they inform each other, sometimes they don't. And sometimes I've got a dead period where I'm like, crikey, what am I going to do now? I need to earn some money. I'm sure you're all familiar with that story what's going to happen next month or next year. So how do you or how do I maintain a portfolio? What does that mean? Um, and what types of work will you do? Will I do? What does that look like? Um, and I mentioned earlier there's lots of different types of work and I'll go into a bit more detail around what they are. So the sorts of work that you might do in a portfolio, you might have a contract and those contracts might be short, mid, long term, they might be fixed term, they might be in and out jobbies, um, there might be uh, commissions like I mentioned earlier, they might be artist in residence schemes or particular residencies, they might be a research project that you lead or take part in a piece of research or that you conduct, so that's also an interesting thing to consider in terms of a portfolio. You might respond to a call out, 
Um, you might respond or apply for a job just as anybody else would do if they're not a freelancer. So that's also a way in, in terms of revenue. It might be a part-time job that you do alongside your freelance portfolio. It could be an individual piece of work. or so, so that could be a painting, a piece of music, a new composition, a performance, a film, whatever that looks like um, could be your piece of work. Or it could be a collaboration as part of a networking or, or something that comes out of a networking activity or a new relationship or a partnership. So those are the sort of things that you might work on uh, in a portfolio. It's hugely varied and um, it's, I suppose it changes and kind of there's niches between different art forms, if you like, within the sector. But essentially you'll find your way. The work is out there. Revenue streams then can be really diverse, there can be all sorts of things and really depend on one, your artistic and creative interests um, and the avenue that you want to go down and that's kind of closely tied into your um, ambitions, your goals, your aspirations um, and or might be based on a, a need. So we all have bills to pay um, and so it might mean that you have X amount of money that you need to bring in to pay your rent or your mortgage um, and then that might mean that you have to secure a particular contract or type of work um, to get by. And so let's go into detail around that and what that might look like. There's lots of things to explore in revenue streams um, and types of money that you could bring in. Um, and I've mentioned a lot of ways around how you might find these types of work and, and make money essentially from your art or your creative practice. Um, but it might be if you work in the performing arts you, and you're a writer or you're a writer, you could look at royalties and licensing um, and or, you know how that residual income is going to come in. There might be a commission or referral fees, particular deals or sponsorships um, or commercial opportunities that you could explore on the periphery or even as a driver uh, through, the thread, through the middle thread of your work. Um, so bread and butter jobs, I call it bread and butter because it's kind of like that day-to-day -day stuff which might feel a bit boring and the temptation is to just go and get an office job. Um, and I've got a list, you know, there's a commonly, the, and also I should say, there is no shame if you need to do that. There's absolutely no shame in that whatsoever if you need to get an office job or a telesales job. And a lot of freelancers do do that. Um, and what that does afford as someone that also has done that as a freelancer, is a bit of perspective back on our industry, which in my opinion is never a bad thing. Um, so it might be that you can work in a complementary role. So as I have a specialist skill in fundraising, my bread and butter work is to work for the Arts Council, providing their access support. So I work one-on-one -on -one with artists and creatives, particularly around enabling them to apply to the Arts Council. So that also complements my creative practice as a producer. It also means that I'm really up to date in what Arts Council want in a funding bid um, and really kind of on the money and I, know, I fully understand um, their application forms and the language, but it basically pays my bills. Um, and that's the sort of example when I mean bread and butter work, something core that kind of underlines the really fancy big projects. So you can wait for them to come along or you can go out and cast the net wide to make these really exciting projects happen for yourself. And then finally, there's so many ways around, around ongoing revenue streams, and they might be things you might make, sell, invent, ebooks online courses, how-to guides, webinars. So that whole digital side of things, if that's relevant to your practice, might be something that you consider around uh, increasing your revenue streams, having things that people can buy, um, like e-guides or, or, or how-to and learning bits and pieces, um, might be something that you could monetize in the future. So all of these things are probably what you might call side hustles um, and it's really thinking broadly about your in the broadest possible sense your skills what skills have you got to offer and are they transferable and probably the answer to that is yes without putting words in your mouth um, but we work in the arts we're creative so we have to do a lot of different things and commonly we're, we're a jack of all trades um, and so those skills will apply to lots of different roles jobs opportunities um, it might be that you could sell merch online. It might be that could be a way in as a, as a nice little earner on the side as a side hustle. Or it might be that you could teach and you've got a particip participatory element to your practice um, where you could teach kids or adults or people in your local community and that's another nice little earner for you. 
So all in all, there's a lot of different um, opportunities, options out there, things that you could explore to increase your revenue and just bring that little bit of extra money in um, when you might need it. All right, so how to write an Arts Council funding application, the elusive question, because it's a bit of a minefield one and also what on earth does a language mean uh, is a common question that I get asked quite regularly. So I've put together some top tips on um, how to be as successful as possible. Now, as with any funding, there's never any guarantee that you'll get a yes, and the chances are relatively high that you'll get a rejection. Um, but there are things you can do to try and negate that and to try and do your best, essentially, that's all that anyone could ever do. Uh, but these top tips are kind of a way in and kind of follow this. I'm not going to say that if you follow this, you'll definitely get the money because it's never that easy. And a lot of it's luck of the draw and how much money they've got around the table at that particular time. Um, but this is hopefully a bit of a guide to help you along the way. First things first. It's a really, well, this sounds really obvious, but shape your project idea. Make sure you're super clear on the aims of the project. What is your project? Who does it include? What does it do? What is the time scale of the project? All of those things and a good sense of your budget. Probably what is a good thing to, to do to start with is does your, ask yourself, does your budget tell a story of the project? which sometimes feels like, why would the budget tell the story? It's just a bunch of numbers. But it is important in terms of mapping your projects because sometimes you might find gaps in your budget. So start with the budget. Ask yourself if it tells the story of your project. Are there any gaps in it? And is it realistic? And is it in keeping with what Arts Council wants to fund? And by that, I mean they have, an, at the moment, they have an under 30K bracket, which is, has a shorter turnaround and decision time, and an over 30K bracket, up to £100,000, which takes roughly three to four months to get a decision. It's a much longer process, but the good thing is between both of those two um, uh, amounts of application form that you could apply for, the form is the same. The questions are exactly the same, basically. So a good thing to do to keep yourself productive when you are when you've got this application open, and so I should say back a step on that, create a template or use a template. These are readily available online. Um, they're easy to get hold of and essentially it's a Word document or a PDF or a Google Doc that's got all the questions in already and that you can draft your answers straight onto there rather than straight onto Arts Council's funding portal called Grantium, um, which is a whole other story which I'll come on to later. Um, so a good thing to do once you've got your document, your template set up, set a productivity timer or use a technique. What I typically use is the Pomodoro technique, which is a productivity technique. And basically, I set a timer for 25 minutes and then I have a five minute break. And it's critical, and this, this is, sounds all hypothetical and great in practice, but I promise you it actually works, especially when you're looking at an Arts Council bid, where you're deep in the questions and thick in, this, in the drafting and the writing and getting out the information from your head onto the page. Super important to set timing around that and give yourself a break after every five, every, every 25 minutes, give yourself a five minute break. And that's what I do, and it works. The next thing is, Try, if you can, to get a pair of outside eyes. So first of all, test your idea on or with somebody else. And if you don't have a professional colleague or person or mentor that you could go to, um, or someone you're working with or a collaborator within your project, is that someone at home? Could you just read your ideas to somebody at home and, and do the kind of common sense test? Does it make sense to somebody who isn't connected or is connected for that might be? Is there a common thread through your, the story of your project? Is it clear to someone who doesn't know what it's going to be? It's a really good test um, right at the beginning and then we do that again towards the end of the writing. So at the beginning and at the end it's a good test on is it, does it make sense? Is it clear? The next thing that I tend to do when working on bids is draft it. Get all of the ideas out and onto the page, which I mentioned earlier. Get them down. It doesn't matter how coherent they are, whether they make sense or not. And it could even be a list of bullet points. It could just be as simple as that, that you can come back to afterwards or at a later date or at the following day. Just get it out of your brain first and foremost. And then if you're working with somebody else or in the instance you're working with an access support worker, the sort of work that I do in supporting these bids, hand it over to somebody else and kind of go, I've got it all out of my brain. It doesn't make much sense, 
but the gist of it's there. The main crux, the kind of the juicy detail, is in a list or a couple of sentences, and it's clear what it's going to be about. The next thing to do is to make sure you're gathering the supplementary uh, information. So in the, for an Arts Council bid, you'll need to make sure that you've got a letter of support or somebody that can vouch for your work. Or if that's a partner and they're giving you something towards the project, are they giving you in kind? Are they giving you a space for free? Are they giving you a residency? If someone's giving you something or they, are, uh, they can vouch for the professionalism of your work or the quality of your work, get that on a letter-headed paper and get that from them and save that to be uploaded to Grantium at a later stage when the application is ready because that's a really good testimony and it tells the Arts Council that you are fundable essentially. So start gathering them, you'll need to give people and partners adequate time to write that and to send that back to you. Other things that you'll need to do are make sure you're gathering biographies of your collaborators. If there's other people involved in your project, gather that information from them. You know, what, is their, uh, what are their professional credentials? Have you got a mini biography of their uh, professional work? And why are you working with them? A good sense and clarity around that. That could just be a table or a list. And if you do choose to use a template, commonly on the Arts Council application templates, there's already a table populated that you can copy and paste everybody's information straight into. A bit about Arts Council buzzwords then. We could be here all day, we probably could spend 30 minutes just talking about the buzzwords that Arts Council require if you like or unpicking the terminology within an Arts Council bid and the questions that they ask. However, my main and top tip in regards to buzzwords is use their words back in your answers. So if you see a word in the question, for instance, in the Arts Council applications at the moment, they are very clearly aligned to the Arts Council strategy. So first of all, back a step, read the strategy. Even if it means nothing to you, give it a read and look at the sort of language that they are using. That's point number one. Point number two is use their own language back in your answers. So if you can, drop in and litter or pepper their words in your answers so that they see their language reflected in what you are, you are saying you're going to do. Um, and you might need to unpick that a bit, you might need to write an answer, read it and think, does that make any sense? I'm not sure that's clear. Um, or, or it might come out and it'd be fine. And you think, okay, that's about how inclusive my project is, which is one of the investment principles, one of Arts Council's priorities is to look at inclusivity and relevance. And it might be that you use those two words within your, each of your answers so it super drums home to the person that's reviewing your application that you're meeting that criteria. The next thing that I'd do is now comes a time of going through it, going back through it, go through it again, check it and check it again. Um, it can't be stressed enough. Keep going through it. Um, if you use uh, online tools and software to check through your uh, grammar, I would recommend doing that as well. There's lots of different pieces of software to help you do that. Get them on board. Use them. Use them to help you one draft, and, but also to keep going back through spell, punctuation. Spelling and punctuation is obviously a thing that you need to get right. Um, use software to the max if you need to. So that's another top tip there around the drafting, the checking, and check it again. So then, onwards to the budget. I mentioned that right at the very beginning around making sure your budget uh, stacks up and you've accounted for all of the different costs. Now what's really critical is to make sure that it balances. So your income and expenditure need to be the same amount. And where Arts Council is concerned, they will ask you to break down the cash that you have coming in, your in-kind support or gifts to the project. And as I mentioned earlier, they might be free space, free staff support, uh, any number of other types of um, uh, support for your project, which has a monetary value, but the money's not coming into your project. But it still has a value and it's still important to include in your budget. So that, those two together, cash and in-kind, uh, total up your income and then your expenditure is a whole long list and there's lots of different categories of expenditure like overheads, so things like travel, accommodation, per diems if you're paying people and they're away from home, food, subsistence, there's a lot, there's a category there for that, there's artistic and creative spend, there's assets, there's how are you marketing your work, how are you making your work accessible, all of these have their own category, so go through it and unpick it and categorise your spend according to what is on the Arts Council table. 
um, and that will make total sense when you start looking at the form. Critically, your expenditure needs to match your income. When you are editing and going back through and checking, a good question to ask yourself, which is a bit of a test question, which I ask myself a lot when I'm drafting and writing applications, is so what? So what? What, you know, why? So what? What's the difference this project's going to make? Um, and that's a, a really good question to ask yourself because if you ask yourself that and you think, oh, wow, it's a bit by the by and it's a bit washy-washy, then that's telling you that you need to be clearer, one, and two, you need to make your case more compelling. Make it more convincing. Who are you selling this to? Don't forget the person that's reading it at the other end might not know who you are. They might know nothing of your practice and nothing of the people that you want to work with. So why would they want to fund you? Make sure that the story you're telling is super, super, super <laughs> compelling interesting um, and meets their criteria. So the so what question is very important to ask when you're in the drafting stage. Next up then is ask someone to proof it. So right at the beginning of the process, I talked about testing your idea and getting someone to read through it, read through your idea, read through the thread and, and testing that on someone. Now is the time to do it once the application is drafted. So, and it's a long old, it's a long old beast. The application is a long, long thing. So someone who is um, ideally interested in your idea or connected to your idea, or maybe not, maybe a friend or family member, get them to proofread it. And what they're proofreading for is the, any mistakes, yes, but again, is it compelling? Is it clear? Onwards then, the elusive character count. Oh my God. I'm not going to lie, it's very difficult. Okay. <laughs> and that's slightly sarcastic, slightly true. Um, the character count on an Arts Council bid is the bane of everybody's life. Um, and let me think of how to describe this and how to say, how do you navigate this? Well, basically, draft it first, then do an edit and a cut. And the likelihood is you're going to have to keep cutting until you get it down to count. But the test is, does the answer still say what you want it to say in a clear, coherent way, which isn't choppy and the sentences don't flow from each other. They still need to flow. It still needs to have a nice thread to it. It still needs to tell your story, but within the count. So cut, cut, cut. Make sure that you cut fluff. Any filling words or kind of any words that you think that can go, get rid straight away and use ampersands. So Grantium um, accepts ampersands in the place of the and word and that you'll be surprised if you do that for every time you write the word and cuts down your count quite significantly. If you keep going through that process, all in all, you should get down to count. But it's a bit arduous and you need to make sure you give yourself ample time within your bid writing process to do that final edit and to get all the answers down to count. Now comes a time then when you're ready, if you feel ready and the application is drafted, the budget balances, you're down to count to move it on to Grantium. So Grantium is Arts Council's funding portal. You need to make sure you've got an account on there. So if you haven't already done that, create an account for your individual practice, you as an individual or your organisation or both maybe. Uh, and you copy and paste from your live document straight onto Grantium and work through it methodically, however that works for you. Um, and you'll see you, it's very easy to navigate in terms of clicking through each page. Uh, and Arts Council are really helpful inquiries and customer service desk if you do get stuck. But again, if you can work with somebody and you've got another pair of eyes helping you input or helping you proofread, that's never a bad thing. And I would recommend doing that as well. Once everything's on Grantium and you've uploaded all of your supporting documents and sort of supporting documents that they might ask for are cash flow. So if you're going for a really large grant, they might ask for a cash flow alongside the budget that gets uploaded onto Grantium. They might ask for a number of other documents, make sure they're all uploaded. You've completed all of the forms to your knowledge. You'll get through to the submission summary page and you'll see it's very satisfying. Well, I find it satisfying um, that the, it's either a red cross or a green tick. And you're looking for green ticks all the way down that, that submission summary page. Once you've got all green ticks, you're good to submit get it gone. Well then, that was a bit about, a bit, a lot about Arts Council funding. That very much kind of talks you through top tips or a bit of an approach to a project grant process. There is more to it than that, um, but particularly, there's a lot of guides online first and foremost. So, so in addition to what I've just said around how to go through the process, 
Always check the additional information. There's a lot of guides, easy read information, material on the Arts Council website. Familiarise yourself with that. And if there's something super unclear that you're still struggling with, like I said, contact their customer services. They're really, really helpful and someone will get back to you to help you about that. Other types of funding and revenue. So there are other types of money that you could go through out there in terms of funding. So only around funding, so not thinking of this as a revenue stream or something that you could earn or turn into a bit of a side hustle or cash, but cash that comes in the form of a grant or a bursary or a commission. So there are lots of trusts and foundations out there. Many of them are arts and culture specific, many of them are not, but there may be crossover in the work that you do in terms of the benefits of your creative or artistic practice or product. And it might be that a foundation specializes in children and young people and they're looking for projects to fund and you happen to come along and you're working through, you running a performing arts project with children in a particular community and they want to fund children in that community. That's a good match. You could contact them, write a letter to them or an email and talk to them about funding your projects. Some of them it might be more of a straightforward process than that and they're advertising, apply to our fund, it's a deadline of whenever date. Um, so there's lots of ways in there and if you, there's a lot of databases. So I would recommend signing up to funding databases, so give that a Google. Sign up to a funding search engine and then you'll get regular updates through email of trusts and foundations that have got live and open grants. And then it is simply a case of going through ones that you think might be relevant, align with your project and applying to them or if they don't advertise an application process, contacting them to build a relationship with them and to ask them how do you go about securing money from them for your project. Trusts and foundations it's really important to build relationships and I should have said that earlier around Arts Council which is not quite the same in the sense that relationship managers who are the people that work at Arts Council that, that score the bids and award the funding in most cases are often at capacity so it's quite difficult to pin them down for a meeting but pursue that Pursue that and build a relationship with a relationship manager in your art form area if you can. So that's about Arts Council, but where trusts and foundations are concerned, find out who the grant manager or the grant director is or the person that is in charge of giving the money out, essentially, and start talking to them and talk to them about your project. Is it interesting? Does it align with their goals, their ambitions, uh, what they want to be funding? But that relationship is important and sometimes vitally critical because that trust or foundation might have a trustee group, a board to go to take their funding decisions to and not only are you convincing that one person you've got a relationship, if they're compelled by your project they will tell everybody else how good it is, voila, the money's coming your way. That makes it sound super easy, it's not always that easy but a lot is based on relationships. Arts Council's DYCP is a grant essentially for you to develop your creative practice. You define your projects, they give away up to £10,000 and when I say you define your projects, you basically say this is what I need. These are the needs right now in my creative practice. I need training, mentoring, coaching, I need to go and talk to that person, I need to be shadow that person, I need to go into the studio, I need to give myself a sabbatical, it could be any number of things, it could be overseas travel. Any number of things within what you think you need in your practice and essentially the application is three questions one of which is about you, your biography, your credentials, your professional work where you discuss that and the two main questions are what do you want to do and how do you want to do it is the middle question and the final question is why and why now, what's the impact and what difference is this work going to make on your practice or career or projects or revenue or any number of um, benefits back to you as an individual artist or creative practitioner or leader or manager. So um, DYCP is well worth considering. Um, it's a, they have uh, deadlines. So unlike Arts Council's project grants where that's an open rolling program you can apply at any time of the year DYCPs have rounds with a particular deadline, so it's worth checking that out and it might be something to explore now or something in the future. Another type of funding or revenue that you may consider is crowdfunding. 
So another avenue to go down is there's lots of platforms out there where you can crowdfund. And the significant thing and the important thing to remember with crowdfunding is this is a general public who are giving their money to your cause. So note the, the change in terminology there. So commonly you would have a project that you want to crowdfund for, an event or a thing or a product, but that has to be a good cause. So this comes down to how compelling you write your case on that crowdfund platform that will go out through social media, online. People will see it. Does it appeal to them? Do they care about it? Is it a worthy cause? And if it is, and they feel drawn to your project or piece of work or event or whatever it might be, they'll be inclined to give you money. But the thing is, you need to make sure they get something back from that. So unlike funding, which is money to do your project or money to make your work, crowdfunding can be that, but commonly you have to work in a reward or some kind of incentive or something you're giving back to people that are gifting to you, to your cause. So that's just some things to consider there. And a client of mine recently did super well on a crowdfunder. Um, and the, the organization that she did the crowdfund through matched the money she made from the general public. That's also a common occurrence. So look at it. It might be an option for you. It might not, depending on the work that you do. Another thing to look at might be, uh, similarly to a crowdfunding uh, uh, way to raise money, is a subscription or a patron. And I think the main one that comes straight into my head is something like Patreon, which similarly to crowdfunding, people sign up to, they pay a regular fee, commonly every month they'll pay a set fee, and there's different tiers to those fees, so it could be like two quid a month up to 200 quid a month, just to give an example, they vary a lot. And for, for what do they get back for that? What, it's building a following, it's building fans, if you like, or followers or an audience to your work. What are they getting month on month? So you need to give them content or give them pieces of work or give them something to go on um, if you are going to use something like Patreon. But it's an interesting thing to look at to have residual income coming in through the work that you produce, the work that you're putting out into the world. And it's a good way to build an audience, a following or a community. And finally then, the last type of revenue funding is direct sales. So if you are making a product, how are you selling that? Where are you selling that through? Are you using a third party to help you sell that? Is it directly through your website and e-commerce? What does that look like? And if you have a product, how are you selling that? How are you marketing that? Who is that going through? How can you refine that process and reduce costs so that minimally the work is going in and it's not costing you as much as it is to make the work and sell the work? and the money you get in from the work. So make an assessment there, but that's another mode of revenue. Seeking match funding then. So there is a, I'm gonna tell you six top tips or steps to success, if you like, around an approach to asking for match funding. Because commonly I get asked, yeah, but how do I ask that person? What do I say in an email? How do I even introduce myself and my work? How do I ask them for money? Um, and if maybe that's a British thing and we all feel a bit weird about asking for money and talking about money. But more often than not, and the first thing I'm going to say is just ask. Just be straight up and say, I'm doing this project. It's, it's going to be really cool. Do you fancy putting something into it? Be straight up. People like honesty. Is my very first opening bit on that. But the six... Uh, steps for success are as follows. Number one, then, start with your project budget, which I've mentioned throughout this webinar. Look at your budget. Where are the gaps? Where are the holes? Where might you fill those holes from? Who might support that? So if you've got a particular area of your budget that you think, I really need to get £2,000 and it's going to cover off my outreach or my education or my learning activity, who might fund that? Who is interested in your project delivering their goals for them? And that is critical as well, is that is your project meeting another organisation's or another funder's goals? If so, that makes your life a little bit easier because you can say, look, I know that you are about supporting young people to access the arts and my project does that in these ways and, and I'm looking for £2,000 support. Would you be interested? Have you got that in kind or have you got that cash? is a straight up ask. Number two is identify who might support your work. So a little bit on what I just covered in the last, uh, the last point is who, ask who, why would they support your work? 
and um, matching up aligning is really important. Three, distinguish between cash and in-kind support, which I've touched on throughout this webinar. Um, in the eyes of most funders, and particularly Arts Council, they don't give a distinction on the percentage of how much cash and how much in-kind. Some funders do specify that and they will say to you, 100% of your match funding needs to be cash, cannot be in-kind, or some funders will allow 50%. It just varies depending on their criteria, so always check the criteria um, and make that distinction between cash and in-kind. Um, and then that's important when you're asking people to support you as a match funder, whether it's in that, that gives clarity then across the board. Four then is make an approach. Be bold, sell it to them, make sure it's a convincing case um, and align, align benefits. Talk about the impact, what's the difference this is going to make for them. Your project's going to do this and that's going to do that for them. Be really clear. Five, you might need to build a bit of a relationship. These people might already be in your network. Networking is super key, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, these might be in your extended network, or it might be a completely new relationship. So spend time investing in that. Have they got events that you can go to? Have they got shows that you could turn up to? Um, are they going to be a particular meeting in the next city or, or you know, in the extended network? Sniff that out, find out what they're up to, build a relationship with them. Write to them by email, call them, get in touch. Start that relationship and nurture that relationship. Finally then, and what you need to do for any funding bid is get that request, that support in writing. That could be by email, it could be a formal letter, but make sure you get that confirmed in writing so that you've got that thread through and that confirmation ready to go. How to present yourself in a business capacity to other sectors then? Mostly is about the proposition. So is your prop and a proposition basically means is it clear what you're offering? What do you do? Why do you do it? Who is it for? Where is it happening? All of those, and how is it happening? How are you doing this? All of those key questions ideally need to be front and center, one in your mind and two on, in any comms that you're putting out through your website, through your social media, any um, other types of communications. I don't know of anyone who still uses print, but maybe they do, in which case I'm there as well. Is that proposition super clear? And if you are approaching other sectors outside of the arts, culture and creative industry, why are you doing that? What is the benefit, one, to your project, but two, what's really important is, why is it important to them? And a lot of corporate uh, companies and, and the corporate industry, for instance, have a CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Strand Department or person working for that organisation. Corporate and social responsibility means they are actively looking to give back to their community or to a good cause or to a particular benefit. And they are often health, social, well-being, community outcomes. And the chances are likely your project's going to meet or cross over some of those benefits or outcomes. So dig that out. It might be a bit of research that you need to do. Um, and it's an approach. It's an approach. It's all based in the relationship again. Find who these people are, build a relationship with them, contact them and talk to them about funding your work and contributing to your work. Um, be confident is what I want to say. We don't do ourselves justice in the arts and culture sector. Be confident. We are fundable and we are worthy of money from outside, from other sectors. Um, go for it. Things I'd wish I'd known starting out then. My career actually goes back, mm, oh, this gives my age away, about 15 years. And I will never forget the first ever funding application that I looked at and I thought, what is this? Without throwing a, a swear word in there, which I think we would all love to do when it comes to funding. Um, being polite about it, I was like, what does that even mean? I've got no idea what that even means. I wasn't a particularly academic kid. Um, I specialise in dance and I trained as a dancer. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't write essays. I certainly didn't write any answers to any funding bids. And I landed it and my boss at the time said, oh, you need to go for this funding. It's really important for this programme, which we're going to do in the future. And I was like, OK, cool, look through it. And I was like, oh, my God. So here is a list of things that I wish I'd known when I started out. Firstly, then, which I think we might all know, but the industry and the sector is a very small world. 
and everybody tends to know each other or by extension knows of other people. That is both a pro and a con. So it's a pro because word spreads and if your work is good and fundable, that will soon pass around. And once you start securing money, that can only grow and grow and grow. Um, and the con tends to be keep your reputation positive and professional. Do good work, essentially, is what I'm saying. Because if you do bad work, word also spreads. Next thing is, you kind of learn as you go, which feels like a bit of a cop-out because I've just delivered a 45-minute webinar on how to get funding. But you genuinely do learn through experience. The more you do, the better you get, the quicker you get at writing applications, and the more you form your own vocabulary and language and, and um, bank of words or sentences or, or statements around your word. It comes much easier and quicker the more that you do it and the more that you practice. There will be times that you get rejected, which I said earlier, and success rates now more than ever are, it's really difficult to get funding. There is a crunch on money. Everybody seems to be applying for money and the money will only ever go so far. So the chances are fairly likely you'll get a rejection. Grit your teeth and go again and keep going until that money comes in is what I can say. A number of times I've had really big rejections and small rejections and, and it can be hard to take. But if you can, grit your teeth, go again and go again. Another thing that I wish I'd known when I started out is what makes this work or this project or me if I'm going for a DYCP, what makes it special? Why? What's important? What's the USP? And if you can really put that across in a non-drab language, so hype up yourself essentially, which is sometimes a bit uncomfortable and a bit feels a bit weird, but give yourself hype. Think about who your hype man would be and channel that person. Bring that into your writing is what I could say. Next thing that I wish I'd known, know your worth. So it's a, a, lot of, a lot of times I get asked by artists, and in, particularly independent creatives, how do I charge? Well, how do I know how much I'm going to charge for this piece of work or this project? I don't even know, and I can't pay myself this. Look at the industry rate cards, of which there are many out there, and look at the calibre of the people that you're working with. Are they experienced? Where are they on their journey? What types of work have they done before? Make an assessment based on knowledge, essentially but know your worth and pay yourself your worth. Networking is really key. It really is who you know. We are, an in, we are a very small industry and we're, we're a small country and everybody tends to know each other, even outside of a city. If you're based in a city or region, everybody seems to be interconnected and those connections will pay dividends at some point. Um, and so networking is key, build your network. Other people that have delivered these webinars might have touched on this, but brush up on your business skills. And what I mean by that is brush, brush up on business, know your numbers, know your le a little bit about legal, know how much insurance costs, because that might be important for your budget. Those sort of bitty extras that you need for running your business as a sole trader or an organisation, those sort of costs always need to go into a bid first and foremost, but you need to be on that as well as a freelancer. I wish I'd known that when I started out as a freelancer, kind of found it out along the way, which most of us do. And I wish I'd had someone to tell me, this is how you do it. Um, but here we are, you find your way. So brush up on those business skills. And there are lots of schemes, training, advice, lots of information is out there on that. Moving on then, find your tribe which I've talked a lot about relationships here in the context of match funding and finding people to support your work and if that's the general public through crowdfunding, find who your tribe are and that might be a process of cultivating relationships and, and going down roads and exploring where they might go. Sometimes you might come to a dead end but more often than not they might pay off, it might not be now, it might be five years time but always pursue, cultivate your network, cultivate your tribe and build those relationships, really important. And finally, be open, be adaptable. These funding, the landscape that we live in, the arts, the arts, certainly the arts council world, the arts and cultural and creative sector, we're in a rapid pace of change. Things are changing quickly and so do criteria and the types of funds that are out there. So stay ahead of that. Be looking at what's coming up, what's changing, any announcements, sign up to mailing lists so that you're the first to know. Be ahead of the game and proactive so that when a change does come, you are ready for it. I've talked a bit then about what it's like to be a freelancer and talked you through some of the process. And this is it. 
uh, well, a footnote to say is, it's different to every single person as well, and you will find your way, and the people that support you and help you in your network will also have their ways. There is no right or wrong way to apply for funding. Um, just what I recommended today is what I found to be successful. There will be things that I've missed and things that I can pick up in the Q&A, which I will really welcome any questions or comments on this webinar today, and please feel free to contact me um, I'm happy to work with one-on-one -on -one with people or offer advice as you need it um, and I hope you found this useful today.